sir. Jeg tror ikke lige for jeg leder den der. De har også nok kunnet tage fra fasaden her.
jeg taler i helst. Hello everyone and welcome to your second session on the People Power Track. We are now ready to begin. And without further ado, please help me welcome a moderator and a good friend of Aarhus Symposium, journalist and anchor at TV2 Business, Vibeke De Bjerg. Thank you very much, and um, it's nice to uh, see you all again. I'm hoping a lot of you also uh, joined me uh, with Bjarke Ingels. Uh, now we're going to continue with a fascinating and interesting man. Um, this one is actually uh, a graduate from uh, Aarhus uh, Universität, but uh, I suspect a lot, some of you are from the business department, so you're probably already experts in uh, Porter's Five Forces and marketing mix and whatever. Uh, he didn't do that kind of stuff when he was at school. I'm suspecting that he uh, studied Nietzsche and uh, discussed moral dilemmas while drinking some Bourgogne. <laughs> and, um, and he's continued to, uh, to be unique. Uh, he is unique because he's one of the only, if not the only, philosopher in the, in the top of Danish business life. And this uniqueness has also... Um, I think described his career. Uh, he uh, he took Danske Bank with uh, with Storm. He actually was promoted six times in six years, and then he went on to help Vestas through some uh, some windy times. 
And uh, now he's a master of his own. And I sub sub suspect, again, he's doing fairly well in, uh, in Voluntas, where he's uh, also made a unique business model. So uh, without further ado, I think we should just please welcome our unique, powerful speaker, Morten Albeck. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind uh, introduction. Um, now, I'll talk about the power of love, uh, because in the end of the day, that is the most interesting topic for any human being, because could we start out by agreeing that the absolutely best time that we're spending, we're spending with people that we love. Would anybody try to argue against that statement? Because then, if you do so, you should be capable of arguing that the best time in life is spent with those that you do not love. So can we agree that the best time spent in life is time spent with those that we love? Then please ask me why we have designed, structured work life in such a manner that we're spending so many hours of our life with people that we do not love. And then tell me, why do we accept that? So please have that in your mind for the rest of our conversation. And then let's discuss time. Now, I know that semantically we've manipulated the mind of us humans to believe that there is quality time, that there's work time, that there's family time, there's time for love, there's time for running. But please tell me whether there's more seconds in a minute when we talk about quality time than working time that time runs slower when we are with those that we love or we are with those that doesn't at all give any meaning to us. Time is an absolute and it cannot be divided. So there's just time, there is not quality time, there's not work time, there's not family time, there's just time and time is running fast. Then life. I have the deepest respect for any type of belief, but allow me to be transparent about what my belief is, and that is that we live once. And I have no whatsoever imagination that I'm gonna be reborn, neither as an animal or as a better human being than the one that I have the potential of becoming in this body. So time is absolute, and we're living one life. And the time that we spend with those that we love are the time that we spent the best or most intelligently. Now, this morning when I woke up and looked myself in the mirror and I got struck about that it was visible that I was no longer 36, I am 41. I know that probably the majority of you have been thinking, it can't be true, he must be 35. No, <laughs> I am 41. But when I looked in that mirror this morning, I didn't see Morton, the dad, more than the husband, more than the lover, more than the friend, more than the entrepreneur, more than the professor, more than the philosopher. I just saw one Morton. There was just one Morton. One person living one life in real time and is running ahead and is disappearing incredibly fast. Bear that in mind. Then I want to introduce you to the most mind-blowing anthropological study I've ever read, which is a study done by an Australian hospice nurse. A nurse working at a hospice where she started to interview the patients that knew that the next breath could be their last, that the morning that they saw could be the last they ever saw. And she asked them about the same question. What do you regret in the life that you know is gonna vanish very, very, very soon? And what she documented was that we human beings, independently of whether we were going to die wealthy or in debt, whether we were in our first or third marriage when we were going to disappear, whether we had many or few children, whether we were yellow, white, black, red, whether we believed in the one religion or nothing, we shared the same regrets. We shared the same five regrets. I don't want to go through them all, but just mention a couple of them and then focus on the one that has truly changed the way that I see leadership and how I have developed my leadership philosophy. So one of the regrets were that we didn't spend more time with the ones that we loved. We just spoke about that. 
that we didn't allow ourselves to be more happy, also indicating that happiness is not something that is coming to you from the outside, but something that you have to master from the inside. But the one regret that we shared as human beings that have changed my way of looking at leadership was that we regret that we worked so much. We regretted that we have spent so much time on working in the one life that we're now looking back at and very soon you would no longer exist. My leadership philosophy is based on ensuring that the absolute minimum of people that are exposed to organizations that I co-own, that I chair, or that I lead directly will look back at those minutes, those hours, those days, those weeks, those months, those years of their life and regretting that they actually spent them with me and in that organization. Now, to ensure you don't end up regretting the tremendous amount of hours that you very soon when you graduate is going to invest into an organization or into work, you need to know yourself. You need to be aware of yourself. You need to develop a healthy and deep and strong self-awareness. Because first, when you're aware of who you are, you can define what the meaning of your life is. And first, when you've defined what the meaning of your life is, then you can define what a meaningful work life is. Let me try to explain what I'm meaning with um, a little uh, party game. Now, this game you can do with a person that you've known for 15 minutes or 15 years, it doesn't matter. Now, imagine that you were to turn to the person that is sitting on your right side just now and you ask that person whether he or she was capable of underneath 45 seconds in a stringent, concise, logical manner to answer on what is the meaning of his or her life. Now, you would, if you did so, ask that question, pop that question immediately and just now, you would in nine out of 10 cases get an answer that would be so cloudy, so absolutely impossible to understand without any structure, any logic, that will actually make the former prime minister of Denmark, Paul Nye Rasmussen, uh, look like an intelligent rhetorical uh, person. <laughs> now, the reason why you will answer so unclearly, so inconcise, on that one question that in my book is the most important question for any human being at all times to master and have a clear answer in, is not because you don't have the intellectual, the emotional, or social intelligence to be as clear in your answer on that question as you are clear on more or less any other question. It's because it's a question that you not constantly and always prioritize to confront yourself with every day, your whole life. Now, another social game uh, that I would like to introduce you to uh, is one that you can only do when you meet a person for the very, very first time. We imagine that you're going to uh, a party on Friday, meaning today, uh, and uh, you meet a person for the very first time. You shake hands, present yourself with your full name, you take a little sip of the white wine, nobody is intoxicated yet, and then you turn to the person you just met, and then you say, so tell me, who are you? If you do so, then you'll be witness to the following, that that person inside the first 15 seconds will start telling you what he or she is doing slash working with. And when they start doing that, it's very important that you interrupt them immediately and then tell them that your vocabulary is so rich that if you really wanted to know what they were doing, you were capable of designing the question, <laughs> what are you doing? But that was not the question that I asked you. I asked you who you are and you're telling me what you're doing. Even though that we're all intellectually capable when we turn on our cognitive, capacity to know that we are so much more as humans than our profession, as well as life is so much bigger than work life, that work life is just one of many corridors in the life wheel. But nonetheless, most of us, when we're confronted with the question without any notice, with who we are, we answer with our profession. Now, coming back to how you develop a healthy self-awareness, which I truly believe is the most important quality for any person at all times to master, having a healthy 
self-awareness. What does it mean to have a healthy self-awareness? It means that you're aware and equally aware of your weaknesses as well as your strengths. That you're equally aware of what you will never ever be capable of becoming and who you actually have the potential of becoming. That you are as precise on your minuses as your pluses. That's a person that has a healthy and strong self-awareness. Now, let's talk a little bit about the latter that I believe that you should go through. And here's important now, of course, we're talking about leadership. We're talking about leaders. But who wants to have a leader that can't lead himself as a human being? Isn't the absolutely most important leadership challenge any human being has to lead themselves in a trustworthy and graceful manner through life? Leading yourself to a meaningful life. And if you're capable of that, then I'm absolutely sure you're also capable of supporting others in finding their meaningful path in life. But back to the latter of human, I would say, development. We have self-insight. Self-insight is a stepping stone to self-awareness. Self-awareness is a stepping stone to self-esteem. Self-esteem is a stepping stone to self-respect. Now, you can meet people that have self-confidence, but no self-insight or self-awareness. They offer big, big challenges. Then you can have people that have self-awareness, but no self-esteem. We've seen it again and again and again through history. The people that actually master something to perfection, they choose to take their own life because they do not respect themselves as human beings enough to actually respect their lives. Now, that is that letter that you every day have to climb and to strengthen. Self-insight, self-awareness, self-esteem, and self-respect. Now, how do you create self-insight? What virtue, what competence, what ability is the most important one to master, to develop the self-insight that is the prerequisite for developing your self-awareness, your self-esteem, and your self-respect? Honesty. Honesty. My philosophical thesis is that the ability to reflect, think, your cognitive capacity, added with honesty, is the shortest way to the most healthy and strong self-awareness. Challenge me on it. Am I right? I hope that we agree that the ability to think and reflect cognitive capacity is a prerequisite for developing a self-awareness. Otherwise, you have to argue that the brain dead actually has a shortcut to self-awareness. So that one we agree upon fairly fast. Then I'm saying if you're only allowed to choose one other virtue, competence, value, capability, only one that should be added to your cognitive capacity that will enable you to develop the most healthy and strong self-awareness, I'm saying it's honesty. Try to replace it with something else. Love. Would that give you a shorter way to a strong and healthy self-awareness? Generosity. Education. Knowledge. Titles. Money. Power. I've not met any person yet that has been capable of arguing that honesty can be replaced with anything else other than those that actually throw in God as what could replace honesty. And let's reserve God to something more meaningful than my philosophical uh, arguments. So honesty, to be honest to yourself and invite people into your life that are honest towards you is a prerequisite for your ability to develop yourself as a human being because that is the enabler for you to develop a healthy self-awareness. Now. Are we born honest? Or is it something that we are trained or given through life? I believe that we are born honest. I believe 
that anybody that have hold their own child or somebody else's child in their arms when it's very small will know that that child reacts transparently, honestly, immediately on your laughter, your cries, your warm, your stress, your awareness or lack of the same. We are born honest, we are born transparent, but it's my theory that that honesty that we're born with is taken out of us as we transform from a child to a youngster to an adult, as we get brought up, educated and civilized, so we no longer intuitively have access to the honesty that we were born with. And I really, really encourage you, before it's too late, to protect the honesty that you're still carrying inside you before that's dragged out of you. Let me try to explain how this honesty is actually dragged out of the modern human being. Imagine an absolutely uh, average middle-class family in the western part of Europe with two uh, working parents full-time. And um, they have kids going to a public school. And um, one day, one of the kids, the daughter, Hannah, comes back from school, and she's been drawing a picture. She's been drawing a picture of a house. The problem is just that it's impossible to see that it's a house. It's actually just three big splashes of colors. There is no house on it. She's incredibly bad at drawing. Aggressively bad. <coughs> her mother receives her when she comes home from school. And the reason why I say that it's her mother is not because I'm a male chauvinist, I'm a declared feminist. I don't think you can be anything else when you are dad to a daughter. No, the reason why I'm saying that it's a mother that's actually receiving the daughter when she comes back from school is because even in Denmark, in 2015, in homes with two parents that are working full time, it's still in 75% of the time, the mother that either picks up the child at school or at kindergarten, or is at home to receive the child when it comes back from school. It's furthermore actually also still the mother in more than 75% of all cases that is primarily taking care of supporting the child with his homework. I'm not saying that the last fact is a reason why our children are reading and writing and doing math so average as they're doing. That's not my point. <laughs> my point is much, much more important. <laughs> Namely that ladies, there is still a fight for equality out there that need to be fought because we're still moving very, very slowly ahead. But back to Hannah that comes with the drawing and she says to her mother, mother, I've drawn our house. And she shows this ridiculous, non-existing painting of their house. And the mother looks at it and she can't focus because there is no house. There's just three colors. But what does she say? She says, ah, Hen, what a lovely house you've painted. What should she have said? She just said, Hen, I really hope that you enjoyed painting that thing. But if anybody, especially an adult, have convinced you that that's a house, you simply have to change your mind. Let's go outside the door and look at how our house actually looks. <laughs> and then please look at the painting again. And then tell me, do they resemble each other? Now, the example is, of course, taken to the extreme. But I want you to think about, because I think that is the finest of all coordinates in leadership. Yes, yes. What is it the mother is teaching Hannah? She's teaching Hannah to acknowledge the existence of something that does not exist. She's teaching Hannah to accept the existence of something that does not exist. There is not a house on that piece of paper. There's three colors and it looks like nothing. That's a fact. When you teach a person 
to acknowledge the existence of what does not exist, then you also teach the same person something else and much, much worse, namely to disregard what actually exists. And when you teach a person to acknowledge the existence of what does not exist and disregard what actually exists, then you free that person to create his or her own world, which has nothing to do with the shared world, where everything is created from love and to growth. Where do we see the most beautiful examples of people that acknowledge the existence of what does not exist and disregard what actually exists? You can't say in politics, something else. X factor. <laughs> now, when is that concept, TV concept, absolutely most entertaining? It's not in the end where we can all hear that the ones that are going to win have no whatsoever quality to be a reincarnation of Lucas Graham. No, the funny part of that concept is in the beginning when there's audition. That's fun like hell. Thousands are coming from all corners of the Kingdom of Denmark to audition with that crazy idea that they can actually sing when it's so obvious for all of us that we could just go in in any backyard, take a cat, pull it in the tail, and then that would have an easier road to actually sing something that was beautiful. And we're sitting there, myself inclusive, and laughing so the tears are dropping from my eyes. But while I'm sitting there and laughing, I start thinking about where the laughter comes from in my body and in my soul and in my mind. And then suddenly I acknowledge that that laughter comes from the same spot in the stomach where I also have, to be honest and say, I have a very, very uncharming habit of also laughing extraordinarily loud when I'm watching these small, small uh, film clips where people are falling <laughs> and hitting themselves terribly without really knowing whether they're going to be paralyzed for life. And then I start thinking about what is the difference between the laughter that I'm laughing at X Factor and the laughter that I'm laughing when I'm looking at the small YouTube clips. And then I find out there's only one difference. And that is that on the YouTube, on the YouTube clips, I do not know whether that person is paralyzed physically for life. In X Factor, I do know they're existentialistic paralyzed because they're acknowledging the existence of what does not exist, their ability to sing, and they're disregarding what actually exists, namely that a whole nation are sitting and laughing at them. Now, the finest power for any person at any time to master is the power of self-awareness. Because then you're aware of who you are, and you're aware of who you are in that big, beautiful, imperfect, complex place called life. Thank you. Thank you, Morten, very much for an interesting uh, uh, speech. I think uh, I would like to just uh, address uh, the audience first by saying you also you have the power in your hand right now. If you think I'm choosing the wrong questions or asking the wrong questions, you can just uh, disrupt it, everything and stand up and, and ask your own questions. So please show some courage and, and let's see some some face-to-face -face questions today. You can do it. Um, that being said, I think we should uh, jump right into uh, a question that you asked for yourself pretty much, I think so, in the beginning. So you now have uh, 45 seconds, please, to tell us uh, what's the meaning of your life, Morten? That, uh, that is to live every day in such a manner that those people with love I cannot live without have an easy day loving me tomorrow. But I've also, <laughs> I've practiced a little bit. So let's, uh, well, let's take it on then. How, how does that affect the way that you uh, live your life and, and lead as a, uh, work as a leader? No, but I, I, I think firstly, uh, it controls my, my greed, my lust, my vanity, my egoism. 
because whenever I think about if I actually was going to do everything my vanity tells me to do, if I did everything my, my lust and my greed wanted me to do, it would be fairly difficult for those which love I cannot live without to, uh, to continue to, uh, to love me. So in that way, it steers me. On the other side, it also says a little bit about why I do believe that love is such an important thing in leadership. Now, when I became a leader the first time in Danske Bank, I was 26 years old uh, and an elegant and really, really kind uh, older man, a colleague came over to me and said, now that you're going to be a manager, it's very, very important that you establish a professional distance to your colleagues and employees. And I remember how my left and right brain just collided inside my head because it simply gave no meaning whatsoever to me. Should I lead through distance? Shouldn't I lead through intimacy? And I've always visualized that the guy that, and he must be a guy, that invented that term professional distance is a German doctor who invented it in the beginning of the 19th century and he had never ever at that time experienced sex or love. Otherwise, you could simply not invent anything as stupid as professional distance. So for me, it's about professional intimacy, establishing professional intimacy, and actually taking a step further. Uh, because I will not hire anybody, anybody into my organization that I do not platonically love. And they should not take a job with me if they are not platonically in love with me either. And now, if you haven't read the book Symposium, uh, written by a guy called uh, Plato, which was written, I think, 356 years before the birth of Christ, then do it. Because there they're discussing what is the finest type of love. It's the love for, for duty, it's the love for, for, for lust, for power, uh, the love to family. And after being discussing that over a lot of wine, Plato uh, concludes that the finest type of love is not the one that is driven by neither the blood or the lust or power or aesthetics, but it's the love that is between two people, independently of whether they actually share blood or lust in each other or share power in each other, but they share virtues, they share values, they share purpose. And that is called platonic love. So when I recruit to my organization, there is a classical step, so you get screened based on your formal competences, then you get into an interview. Uh, that interview primarily is about your ability, those that is going to the next round, is your ability to explain what you're not good at, where you're imperfect, and those that are best at actually expressing their minuses, their imperfections, are the one that qualifies for the next step. The next step, you're giving a case. That case is a case that you are given on a Friday afternoon, and you have to deliver it back Sunday uh, before midnight and you only have a couple of days to rearrange your schedule so you're showing the agility and the, the willingness to actually uh, wanting the job. And then the last interview is an interview between me and the candidate. I don't participate in the other parts but it's just between me and the candidate and the only thing is about whether we actually after that conversation sitting with the feeling that I can fall deeply platonically in love with you and if I can't you shouldn't waste your life on working for me because I only have one life and I want as much love into it as humanly possible. I want to love my employees, I want to love my colleagues, I want to love my friends, and why shouldn't I? And why should we accept the fact when we actually know that there's something called platonic love, why should we actually accept going to work and not striving for that? Secondly, I do not go to work because as I said, there's not work time or spare time that's not work life and family life. That's just one life and one time. So I wake up and go into life. And a part of that life I'm using on working. Part of that time I'm using on making love. Part of that time I'm using on thinking and drinking and whatever. <laughs> but that, that thought is also anchored in uh, the purpose of my, or the meaning of my life. Uh, that I wanted also to make it easy for my employees to uh, platonically stay in love with me but tomorrow. I'm, I'm, 
I'm, I'm sure, Morten, that we uh, we all love you and we would all love to I work for so. you. That and, would be fantastic. And hang out with you every day, but I mean, that that's not possible, no. not yet. Volant nope. is not that, nope. not that big nope. yet, anyway. So what would be your advice then if you were to take your principles into another organization? I mean, how, how, would, how would I bring those principles into TV2? I can't, I can't choose my own boss. No, no, you can't, but you choose who you work for. And I would say everybody in this room is so privileged. Otherwise, you would not be sitting here. You're so privileged that you choose based on your meaning of your life, how you want to use your life, and a big part of that life is going to be used on working for somebody. And why accept working for somebody that you can't have an intimate relationship with? And now you can call it love, you can call it intimacy, you can call it trust. I don't care. But at the end of the day, it's about why work for a human being that doesn't feel anything for you and you don't feel anything for that human being when there is actually alternatives out there. It's simply just a waste of human life and potential. But of course your challenge is I don't have the expectations that DR is uh, a more platonically uh, love-driven organization than TV2. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> I think we have a, a question over yeah. here. Please, uh, when asking a question, please stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Coming back and it got me thinking, of course you provided um, extraordinary like kind of boundary uh, mm. ex like example of that situation, but do you think there was love in a way that the mother in your case would respond of taking the daughter out and yeah. okay, this is the house. Yeah. And that teaching her something else about hierarchy and preconceived uh, assumptions and implicitly instilling in a girl that, okay, mm. you shouldn't do something that is not resembling the reality as it is. Yeah. Otherwise, where does uh, innovation, yeah. entrepreneurial spirit come from, right? Yeah. Yes. In, in that mother's case, if I place myself, I would ask her, where is it that you see the hell? Mm. Show me, please. Maybe yes. I'm having my own idea of a house, mm. and you have something else, and maybe it's a house in the clouds and whatever is it. I would be interested in my child's <coughs> inner world yes. and how is it com comprised of, of, of what kind of imagination and, and ideas she has. Yes. No, but I, uh, firstly, I am falling platonically in love with you just now. And I'm doing <laughs> it. And I'm doing that because we are actually aligned. So firstly, Honesty should always take its point of departure in something constructive, something warm, something loving. So that's the first thing. Of course, if you're just honest with the purpose of destroying another human being, you're a psychopath. And that was the reason why I allowed the mother to say in the beginning, I really hope you had fun while you produce this. Then I think one way of expressing love is via honesty. Now, I think the finest and most graceful type of love is the one that is based on honesty. That's the first thing, because I know a lot of people that are saying they're loving somebody, but they're still dishonest towards them. No, I, I do agree yeah. on, on that one, that yeah. you should be honest, but I think, it, wasn't there in, in Buddhism or somewhere, yeah. that it's, uh, you have to ask yourself three questions before being honest, yeah. or expressing yourself to, in front of other persons, yes. in, in the way of criticism. Yeah. Now, but, here comes, but here comes, like you talked about innovation. Yes. Now, I believe, like, honesty is not the same as the truth. So being, so being honest means that you're expressing subjectively what you see and what you think and what you feel and who you are. But you do not have world domination about what is true. You're just expressing yourself. Now, letting children understand that they will be exposed to other people's opinions based on what those human beings are seeing is for me a very, very healthy thing to teach your children. Secondly, now, I couldn't spend all the time on how the conversation continued after they went outside the house and the mother said, so here's the house, here's your painting. Can you tell me how they resemble each other? Now, just the fact that the mother actually takes the time to take yeah. the kid in the hand, go outside and try to enlighten, that is love. What the normal parent would do is look at the painting and say, ah, that's nice, put it into the back and never ever see it again. So I don't believe that it is not loving to be honest. I don't think it is destroying innovation to be honest if you actually ensure that the child that you are challenging has self-esteem based on 
that you have helped them as a parent to develop the self-insight, the self-awareness? Yes. Yes. Thank you for clarification. That's no, thank exactly you. what I wanted yes. to Good question. Thank you. Thank you. There's another question over here. But I think that, uh, firstly, in Voluntas, we have three principles that we invest out from, and one of them is diversity. And, and, and we have the principle in the portfolio companies that we have that inside a three to five year period, depending on geography and their baselining, et cetera, then there should be an equal distribution between men and women in the board of directors as well as in the executive management team. And now the reason why we have defined that principle is of two reasons. Uh, firstly, it gives a lot of business sense as soon as you start looking into uh, the companies that actually has a, a healthy distribution between the genders, whether it's revenue growth, it's EBITDA, it's return on equity, it's shareholder value, everything is just pointing in one direction. You're creating a much, much stronger company. And what I'm after, I'm, I'm, I'm for profit. I am 120% for profit. And I want to earn as much money as fast as possible on the lowest cost base so I can beat the old capitalism on their own uh, pitch. And for that, I need to create an organization that is attractive for the strongest minds and most motivated minds of both genders. Now, you spoke about maternity leave. And of course, from a government perspective, you can do so and so much, but you choose your life companion. You choose who should companion you through life. And that choice will define whether there will be equality in your life or not. And that no government, no legislation will ever, ever be capable of de-risking. That's a risk of love and of life. So make sure that when you choose your life companion, you choose somebody that actually sees you for what you are and what you can and do not see himself for more than he actually can. Coming back to the self-awareness bit. And you're out for a tough, tough challenge, gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. Another question from the audience? If uh, love and honesty is the meaning of life, how does money contribute uh, to making your life more meaningful? Now, it's, um, it's contributing uh, in my uh, ability to be, uh, to be free and independent. Um, I can say when I became a senior vice president in Danske Bank Group at an age of 30, which were uh, one of the youngest ever in the group's history, uh, I jumped in salary levels quite significantly from a vice president to senior vice president. It was the first time I actually got a, uh, that must be a seven digit paycheck. I chose at that moment to continue to live my life based on my VP salary. I continued to rent cars, rent houses, didn't put anything into materialistic icons that would actually make me dependent on that type of salary. Uh, the first time I bought a house, I bought it. I bought it. I don't owe any, anybody anything. And I think you either choose the one of the two following to continue to be a free mind or free spirit, a free intellectual. Uh, a free human being, either you don't own anything at all, or you live your life significantly below your income level. Because then you're never ever afraid when somebody is actually acting in a way that ethically, morally, strategically is against your opinion, your meaning of life your purpose of being where you are, then you just say, thank you very much. It was a beautiful journey. I'm leaving immediately. Because you know you can take care of yourself and also your loved ones. So, so the fact that I feel that I am economically privileged, which I am, look at the statistics, I am not only among the 1% richest in Denmark, I'm even further up. And then there's, of course, a big difference between being 
the richest and then being where I am, but nonetheless, I'm extraordinarily privileged. I don't need more money because I set it aside and I live a life that is modest compared to, um, to what I could uh, spend. So it gives me, it gives, it gives me freedom. It gives me freedom. Uh, but um, if you already, <laughs> <laughs> if you already earned enough money and uh, then you're free to live a free life that is meaningful for you, uh, why do you continue? Thank you for that follow-up question. That's because that voluntas is created to prove a philosophical point. I want to prove or contribute to changing the DNA of capitalism. Now, the DNA of capitalism, if you study capitalism, have changed several times over that eight, nine hundred years where capitalism have existed, several times. And now it's time to change it again. My belief is that you can only make the old, narrow-minded, black forces of capitalism move their mind and their money to spend them in a much more sustainable, responsible, and meaningful manner if you beat them on their own turf. So now, I have three principles, which is diversity, I just spoke about that. We have uh, sustainability, which says that the value chain that the companies that we invest in should inside three to five years get 100% of all their electricity, independently of whether they are a production company or their knowledge company, from renewable energy sources. And the third one is that they should measure, if there's more than 16 employees, they should biannually measure on the employees' feeling of meaning in life with the work that they're doing. There's no other investment company out there with those three principles. Now, imagine that I can actually prove by building organizations where the meaningfulness quotient is higher than anybody else, where the value chain is screened up and the spread between genders are equal, that I can earn more money faster than if you ignore those three principles. Then I am inspiring to actually change the way money is spent. And that is what is actually truly important. Now, money is a dead thing. Money is as dead as a stone you pick up. The only value money has is whether we earn it and spend it in a meaningful manner and meaningful for yourself and for other human beings. But I have to test you on that. I mean, yeah. isn't that something very easy to say when you have money? Yes, mm -hmm. it is. So how should you practice that if, if you have no money, if you're, I mean, if you're on SU uh, and you're struggling to yes. make ends meet? Yes, but I would say I think when you are on SU, you have a lot of money. <laughs> a lot of up, money. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but here it comes. It's a little bit the only thing I expect. So I just want to finish this question by saying that's the reason why I want to earn as much money as fast as possible on the lowest cost base, and that I want to beat the MSCI index, rolling constantly. Uh, I want to prove that you can earn money in a more intelligent manner uh, and a more modern manner than the way that we're doing it today. And don't forget that most of all the equity out there, the vast dominating part of all equity funds, don't give a shit. It is only marketing lingo, nothing else. It's good intentions, no actions. Then what I do expect from people that are privileged like me, that is that we actually use our privileges to contribute to creating something that is a little bit more intelligent than what we have today. And now, even though that I am rich, I just want to say <laughs> I'm no billionaire <laughs> and uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, betting for the new uh, super yacht that was uh, in the papers uh, recently. But I feel rich uh, compared to what I ever expected I would have in life. Okay. We have some, uh, some more questions up here just a second. I think we should just take one from, from Slido, which uh, yes. A lot of, uh, of our audiences has, has, has asked you to, to answer. I think also already this session uh, bears, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's easy to see that you have a different background because you're a philosopher. And the question is, as a philosopher, you have a very different educational background than most investors. So how does this affect your work? I mean, you've already touched a bit on it, but could you elaborate? Yeah, but I think that, that uh, it's, it's, Now, f philosophy is, is uh, firstly, it's not a science. Uh, it's a hybrid between a way of living and a state of mind. Uh, and it's, 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 it's about that whenever you are in any conversation, independently of the topic, whether you're discussing Bonbu's aggressive success in these days, 
or discussing love, or you're discussing uh, how you optimize the supply chain, then the one question that you always start with and ends with is like, does it actually, like, does it give meaning? Like, is it meaningful for me, for the company, for others? And whenever you start the conversation there, something changes. Let me give you an example. Um, uh, these uh, employee development dialogues, which is very famous and very soon you'll be exposed to them. They're happening at a minimum once a year. Some really, really progressive managers actually have an ambition about doing it twice a year. So let's just look a little bit on this term, employee development dialogue. Now, as a philosopher, I'm thinking, employee, am I sitting in front of an employee or human being? Is it actually practically possible for me to isolate the 28% of you that is an employee and take the 72% of you that is human being and then put that on the one side and then I can only have a conversation with those 28%? As a philosopher, I know that's a manipulation. It doesn't exist. So let's start erasing employee. Now there's just a human. So now there's a human development dialogue. If it's a human development dialogue, where should the conversation then start? And that's the reason why we have redesigned in Voluntas uh, the employee development dialogue to a human development dialogue, which happens not once a year, but every second month, and is organized around two questions, only two questions, and you are going to answer yes or no on both. The first question is, is there anything at work that prevents you from having the meaning in life that you're striving for, yes or no? The other question is, is there anything in life that is preventing you from performing at work as you get paid for and which you aspire for, yes or no? If you're sitting with a person that is answering twice yes, we know that the correlation between that and when the person is either on sick leave or has searched for another job is 100% inside a six month period. Now, that's an example of how the philosophy is helping me to improve processes business-wise by making them more effective and more logical. Um, but is that something that you took with you from, from these halls, from, from the study, or is that something that you I don't know, we're born with these dif this different view of the world. No, but I think when I was, when I was young, and that's a long time ago, I, uh, I, I didn't have the privilege of, of going at a university which is as modern as the one that we have here in Aarhus today, meaning it wasn't possible to blend business and philosophy as you can actually do today. And had that education existed, I would have studied that one. But it wasn't possible, it was divided. And luckily now, you can say the more immersion sites of academia and the more humanistic side of academia is now blending and I think that's just beautiful and it's going to create uh, stronger human beings and better leaders. So, so I think I've always had an interest in business. Um, and then philosophy, as I said, is a state of mind, is a way of living and of course also a methodology and that methodology was the only thing that I actually could when I started in, uh, in Danske Bank. So I just started to see could it work there and then I found out that if you can read uh, Tractatus and Ludwig Wittgenstein, then you can also understand a balance sheet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? We have a question, a question up here. Up here. Yes. Um, yeah, I was wondering, with your philosophical background, uh, how was it to enter a rather conservative organization like Danske? It was... Um, uh, no, but it was actually... Um, it was fairly. It was fairly easy, uh, meaning that, of course, when you get into an organization that is uh, full of engineers, uh, then uh, their perspective on a young bloke with fairly long hair and has a philosophical background is a little bit hesitant to begin with. Uh, but then it goes for entering a new organization as well as it goes for any other new encounter you establish in life, that you prove yourself by the way that you carry yourself and the performance that you deliver. And I haven't been using time, neither in Danske Bank or investors, talking about myself as a philosopher. I went to work uh, accepting the fact that I was, of course, the chief marketing officer uh, of uh, investors. Uh, and when I went to work in Danske Bank, I was the SVP for innovation and idea generation. Uh, I wasn't 
preaching philosophy. I didn't take my language into the business language. I learned the business language. I also dressed like a businessman. I started drinking coffee. And <laughs> I did everything to assimilate myself uh, on an iconographic level. And as soon as you do that, then you also get the freedom to operate. And then, of course, I operate out from my beliefs, my philosophy, my values, my perspective, and my ambitions. But I want to make sure I didn't go to Vestas from Danske Bank because I had a philosophical quest. I went to Vestas because I wanted to find out whether I actually had capabilities inside the discipline that I was working with, which were marketing and business development, that was on an international level and potentially among the best in the world. And that was a little bit hard to find out when you were competing, with all due respect, for Jyske Bank and Sparnor, uh, local Danish financial institutions. If you want to find out whether you're actually truly among the best in your discipline in the world, then you need to compete against the biggest and the best, so the GEs, the Siemens, etc. And that opportunity was one that I could see I could get with, uh, with investors. I think we should just uh, touch in on another part yeah. of your uh, career that yes. you're spending time on these yeah. days. Uh, it says in the booklet that you're doing uh, the digital, helping on the digital strategy for the Vatican City, for yes. the Pope. Um, what's, what's your thoughts on, on working with the most powerful religious person uh, in the world? Uh, no, but I'm, I'm extremely humble and very, very honored that I uh, was, was selected. I, was, uh, I thought it was a, a scam. I thought it was a gimmick. Uh, I truly did when I, uh, when I got the invitation. Uh, I was actually so sure that I didn't want to log in on that protected uh, page uh, that they had sent in a written paper stamped from the Vatican uh, City from their post office that, um, that it was be going to be full of virus or uh, genitals or something very, very bad. <laughs> so I gave it to my assistant because I, <laughs> I told her it's... it's, it's Who it's, you love very much, I love her, tell, yeah. I love her terribly. Uh, and then I told her, because it's, it's, it's better that your computer breaks down than mine, <laughs> so give it a try. Uh, and then I went into a cab and I took off, uh, and then she called me up and said, if, if this is a scam, you have some friends who've been spending a lot of money on this scam. So no, I'm, um, that's really, really a meaningful task. So firstly, I'm not a Catholic. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Protestant. Uh, and the fact that uh, the Vatican State, the Vatican government, um, blessed by His Holiness, have invited 52 people to come and advise them uh, about how to spread uh, tenderness and compassion via arts and technology and human interaction. And then they invite people of all beliefs. Uh, is, is, is firstly, coming back to the diversity, is an inspiration. Secondly, I, I think that he is the most uh, uh, important spiritual person on the planet. I think he's probably also, at least in my context, the most important spiritual person I've been on the planet for a quarter of a century, if not a half of a century. Um, and, um, and I'm just meeting through that work, I'm meeting, I'm meeting people that I never ever believed that I would be acquainted with or friends with. And uh, so it's, um, it's a meaningful task and a privileged task and I, I'm always, uh, I'm always afraid that they're coming over and saying, do you know what, we... Uh, we changed our minds. We changed our minds. <laughs> it was like somebody else we were looking for. Yeah. Yes. Well, we're actually running out of time, which has been flying, but I think we should uh, conclude with uh, one of your, your party games that yes. you told us about. Uh, let's uh, say we're all at, we're, at, we're at the party now, we're drinking white wine, yeah. so Morten, please, uh, who are you? I'm a, I'm a father that uh, is uh, trying to make sure that my kids becomes a better version than me of a human being. And you rehearsed that as well? No, no. I actually just invented it. I, <laughs> I, had an, I had another one which I usually use, but I thought, let me try to be in the game. Uh, and thank you so much for a really good question, and thank you for inviting me. And if you haven't found the meaning of life, I truly hope you find it. And I love you all. <laughs>
thank you, Sijiko, for once again taking part in all this symposium. Please accept the gift. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for this question. As for all of you, your next session will be back here in the TDC Group Auditorium. But please stop by our coffee lounge where you can meet our partners and speakers during the break. Thank you and see you back.